Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome once again to Perfect Love Worship Center's Wednesday night Zoom Bible study. And uh, we are so blessed to be able to uh, gather once again. Sorry about last week, had some uh, uh, urgent business to take care of uh, last Wednesday. I was unable to be on the call. Um, I'm sure it was a wonderful lesson, um, but I'm glad to be here tonight with all of you and to hear from uh, Brother Ed, my father, who is going to be teaching the lesson tonight. And so uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy our lesson number eight in our series on the parables of Jesus. Brother Ed, God bless you. Thank you for your willingness to serve the kingdom through uh, the teaching ministry that God has blessed you with. We give you the liberty to uh, perform whatever God has called you to uh, perform. You have the calm. All right. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate everything you do and, and everything that uh, we hope to accomplish uh, for the kingdom through our Perfect Love Worship Center. And tonight's lesson uh, is in a series of parables we're looking at. There are two parables tonight. And so the title is The Treasure and the Pearl. This is lesson eight. We're talking about two parables tonight, The Treasure and the Pearl. And the scripture text, which I will read, is Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. And the Bible, the word says, again, the kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus speaking to the crowd. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure, unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one, one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So we're looking at two similar uh, parables having to do with things of value, great value. Hidden treasure is a delightful fantasy that captivates the minds and imaginations of most people. What child has not been enthralled by stories of a secret treasure map or a lost gold mine? Now, if I can divert to my childhood, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I guess I was 10 or 11 years old, 10 years old. And uh, we were living in Mineola at the time and in a house that my father, one of many houses that he fixed up. Uh, and this was uh, in the early mid fifties. And so we had some uh, construction going on inside and there were walls with two by fours that had not been sheetrocked yet. Uh, and they were eventually, but the sheetrock was placed over a, a, an item, a box that I had stuck in the wall. It, it was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a plastic box. It was tan in color and I had sealed it with glue. You could open it up. I think it was probably a, a watch, you know, a box that you would display a watch in or something like that. Anyway, so, but in the, in the box, I, I wrote out an acrostic, uh, the letters for the word treasure map. And there it was, and you opened it up and uh, I had drawn a map, uh, obviously uh, fictitious because there was no treasure, but it was all in my imagination and so on. And I felt that that would be kind of neat if eventually someone who maybe would knock that house down in years or decades to come would find that box, open it up and see a treasure map and think, oh, it must be treasure in the backyard. However, uh, as of today, uh, what, almost 65 years later, almost, yeah, about 65 years later, whatever, and, and that house remains up, has not been uh, torn down, and I don't think it's going to be torn down soon. But I tell you what, it was quite a motivation what, that I had when I was a kid. I'm sure you had something similar to this. And I don't know, that's what, that's what I did. I made a treasure map with, the, with my uh, imagination, so to speak, uh, stimulating this uh, desire to do that. And I, you know, who hasn't dreamed of opening an oyster and finding an expensive pearl? 
event, evidently, the idea of hidden treasure was just as appealing to the people of Jesus' day as it is to us. Jesus taught a double parable about a hidden treasure and a priceless and a priceless tool and a priceless pearl. And, and he used this parable to explain our incredible value to God and his incredible value to us. Next slide, please. In all likelihood, the plowman in the parable had plowed the same field many times before. He was familiar with the layout of the land and how it looked. The plowman was a hireling. You know, he was a hired hand. Some, perhaps something like a day laborer or a migrant worker. Uh, the field was not his, it belonged to his boss. So as the plowman plowed the field, he encountered an obstruction hidden beneath the soil. To his amazement, he discovered that it was a treasure. Nothing he owned was of any value in comparison to this treasure. And so joy overwhelmed him and he resolved to sell everything he owned to buy the field. Of course, he was thinking that the owner knew nothing about this treasure. This is fortuitous for him. And so, hey, you know, couldn't possibly be worth anywhere near what this treasure is worth. So anyway, I can, I, I can put myself in that guy's position. I probably would have done the same thing. So now in parallel is the parable of the pearl of great price. The man in the second part of the parable was a merchant and a dealer of pearls, all right? Jesus, and incidentally, uh, pearls, uh, if you know how they're, they're formed, you know, they, you get them in oysters. Uh, and I understand there are saltwater and freshwater pearls, but anyway, uh, pearls are formed in oysters. Uh, oysters will uh, essentially start making a pearl from something that's irritating their insides. If I, if I remember correctly, it's an irritant to the uh, oyster and they want to do everything they can to get rid of the irritants. So they coat it and keep coating that irritant, oh, it's a grain of sand or whatever it is. And so it, interesting that that has a, 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 you know, it's a metaphor in itself, you know, that which, uh, eventually forms to become something of great price can often uh, value that is can often start as an, a direct irritation from whatever it is or however the lord uses to uh to uh, improve our value to him remember we had the parable we had the we have the understanding that going through trials and tribulations it's like going through the fiery trials and furnace it brings us out as we spoke about a couple of weeks ago i think uh, it brings us in, uh, out as refined gold. You know, it takes burning and irritation, burning irritation, serious irritation to get the uh, dross out and we become more valuable. Anyway, that's uh, off to the side. I just want to share that with you, that pearls are something else because they are formed by that process. And the slower the process, perhaps, I don't know all the details, but uh, the slower and the more more coats of of whatever it is that that oyster spreads over that little pebble that eventually becomes the solid pearl and grows bigger and bigger and bigger and that's makes it value more 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 and more valuable i believe of course most of you know that the larger pearls are are the more valuable given that they are they they are formed perfectly and uh, have a certain color to them and so on. And it's nice to have a big one as opposed to a small one, but the shape structure and so on and the source of the pearl gives it its value. Now, so he, this is a pearl, uh, a merchantman who sought priceless items like these, like pearls. Evidently the merchant was good, who was always looking for the best quality of pearls that he could find. When the man finally discovered the perfect pearl, I love that word perfect, he knew that his long search was over at last. He knew that giving up his other pearls and other possessions was more than worth the cost of the great pearl, of this great pearl. It's a pearl collector. And he knew he could give the rest of them up because this pearl was a very valuable pearl beyond. All right. He was a pearl connoisseur, so to speak, not kind of an expert. And there are folks out there. Uh, you can imagine in the diamond industry, 
Yeah. And we know how diamonds are formed. All right. The first meaning of the parables, the treasure that Jesus bought, the pearl that he found, was you and me, the church of the living God. This is subparagraph four, the first meaning of the parables. God values us as his precious treasure, his priceless pearl. That's key to this whole lesson is value and how we are valued by the Lord. In both the Old and New Testaments, God considers his people to be his wonderful treasure. Someone read Exodus 19 and 5. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, now, therefore, if he will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then he shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Now, that's good old KJV. They translated the, the uh, Hebrew to, to the word treasure. It's a very important word. I mean, when, let's get back to when we were kids. We had Treasure Island. Uh, it was a famous novel. Uh, I mean, in my era, we watched Peter Pan. Uh, they were pirates. They were out for treasure and so on. This word is, is really, really so important. It's so important. It should be important to us now. I want to want us to focus on it. Go back uh, and uh, and. And this is like an old landmark, you know, where we're in your in our psyche, in our minds, we have this word treasure. It means so much. Of course, it means such uh, so much in terms of the physical world, you know, do rubies, you know, gold and silver, and all of that in one place. Certainly, that's that's what it is. But in the spiritual sense, we get the the appreciation of that. Uh, uh, word that treasure as we are to the Lord by the metaphor by the use of a compare comparison to what we really know is in, in the physical world is, is, is treasure treasure and and it's it's it helps us to come to a greater understanding of how the Lord sees us how he keeps us and why uh, and we're a peculiar treasure it's not an ordinary we are unique unto him above all people the, the word says the israelites the children of israel we the church like the plowman and the and the pearl merchant christ paid an extremely high price to purchase this treasure he gave everything that he had to redeem us he gave us his own blood to purchase us <laughs> that's tremendous first corinthians 6 verse 19 and 20. Someone read that for me, please. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's a key phrase there, bought with a price. Bought with a price. We should always remind us and come to an understanding that we're not our own. We are bought with a price. There's the concept of ownership here. Who owns us? Really? Who owns us? It is God who created us and owns us. You know, it took centuries, two millennia, millennia, really, up until this most recent century, past century, this century, to, for, for us to, to, for the, at least us in the United States and so on, but uh, uh, elsewhere throughout the world over the years. Over the decades, it took, it took so much uh, time uh, to come to the point where we recognize and despise the institution of slavery. And slavery, the main issue with slavery is ownership. You know, you have a human being owning another human being, the other person, human being, being property to the owner. But here, that goes flies in the face as a capital uh, offense to the throne. In, in the context of this scripture, we are bought with a price. The owner of us, you and me, 
is Christ, is the Lord. It's, it's God. God owns us. How can someone come in between the throne and an individual and call that person uh, their property, that they own them? It's anathema when we think of it. Yet the institution thrived over the centuries. And so we have come to that understanding. And I think the world, of course, de defines it in such a way that slavery is so bad because of how masters treat the slaves and so on. But that's, that's a trivial compared to the real issue. And that is ownership. All right. Praise God. So Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says, I'm, someone read that for me, please. I'll read it. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made. I can't say that word. Had made you overseers to right. feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. Thank you, sis. There you go. Purchased. He bought us with his own blood. Praise God. He owns us. Dare anyone put us into slavery. Dare anyone or any agency or any institution or whatever put us into a slavery situation where they own us. We are intrinsically free. That's where, you know, you are free indeed. That's what the scripture says. Christ has, free, has freed us. We are his. And he has everything for us and on us. He owns us. Praise God. Now, Calvary tells us that we are the pearl of great price. The cross tells us that no cost was too high for our redemption. Wow. The suffering, the shame, the agony, and the death of the cross was the extravagant price that Christ paid for us. We are his treasure. Amen. And there you see that, that scripture, very important scripture. Praise the Lord. The parable was a prophetic portrayal of how much Christ would pay to redeem us or reclaim us back to himself. Redemption, redeem us, the redeeming principle. Wow. Someone read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. He's not listening. Okay, go ahead and read me. For as much as ye know that we that ye were not redeemed with, with corporal things, corporal things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. Precious blood of Christ. He redeemed us. He paid with his blood. Redemption involves payment. You know? Yeah. If anybody play, going back to childhood, back when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, we all played Monopoly, you know, when the guys got together. For that matter, when my sister and I played. And what, what does Monopoly involve? Well, you buy properties, remember? And you get the title deed and all that. And of course, if you, if you needed money to buy something and you didn't have the cash, you could mortgage a property, okay? Then so you got the value of the property from the mortgage, got the money for, by mortgaging it. So you flip the card over, but you could, you could come back and redeem that thing to your total ownership. Take it out of the mortgage and buy with a certain price you pay to, to take it out of the hock, so to speak, or out of, out of debt. Uh, so uh, so many parables, uh, parallels there. It's, it's, it's really neat. We need to remember that Jesus was not forced to pay the price for us. He willingly and voluntarily paid it. He wanted us. It's like when you're playing Monopoly, you want you want all the greens, you know. What is it? Uh, try, oh, North Carolina Avenue, Pennsylvania Avenue. Got to flip those. Over. I want that. I want that Monopoly. So you 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 work on getting some cash to flip those over if, if you have them and they're mortgaged. So there you go. Now Jesus said, "I lay down my life." In John chapter ten, verse seventeen and eighteen. I lay down my life. No man take it from me but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Wow, he actually willingly laid down his life. 
And he had power to take, he, he rose, he, he had the power to raise himself, that he was God manifest in the flesh. Jesus felt that the results justified the investment. Okay, that's kind of a worldly expression for essentially what happened there. He believed that you and I were worth the price that it would cost him. Think about that, how valuable we are to the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Pearls are the result of an invasion and an injury to an oyster. Oh, here it is. I guess, you know, it tells you I didn't really carefully review this list. It's been a while since we did it. And there it is. There's the injury to an oyster. That's how I was describing it earlier. A grain of sand gets inside an oyster and injures the sensitive, vulnerable oyster. The oyster, irritated by the sand, covers the painful sand with mother of pearl. I guess that's what they call it. Yeah, mother of pearl. That's certain. Layer upon layer it goes on until a beautiful pearl is fashioned. Well, the, the more perfect it is in terms of sphericity, roundness, right, and color, that makes it a great price. Of course, pearl experts know how to distinguish uh, you know, you know, run, run in the mill pearls versus the extremely valuable ones because they're so rare. They're so rare. A pearl is never formed without an injury or a wound. All right. From the grievous wound that Jesus Christ suffered at Calvary, a beautiful priceless pearl, the church was formed. Wow. Perfect pearl. There you go. There's that word perfect again. We are the church. You know, Christ in you, the hope of you are the church of the living God, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in his name. Yes, perfect. That's the love of God radiating from us, the church. We are priceless. Wow. Now, chapter, sub chapter five, the second meaning of the parables. So we got the first meeting. Value notes. Here's the second. The pearl that we buy is Christ and his kingdom. Okay, the kingdom, his, his kingdom. The second interpretation of these two parables reveals to us that we are the plowman and we are the pearl merchant. So he flips right over. What a treasure Christ is. Everlasting life is pearl beyond price. Yet many people spend their entire lives plowing the field of life, but never discover the hidden treasure of life. Many people search endlessly for the pearl of great price and yet never realize that Christ is what they are searching for. We as church, we need, as uh, you know, perfect love, we, we want to pray that we uh, are burdened and that the needs are revealed to us and that the Lord would lead us to those hungry and searching and those that don't realize what they're searching for. We want to help, help those looking and searching for the treasure. And we are gifted and, and we have the honor as ambassadors for the Lord to help those to come to understand what we know and understand that they might receive the treasure as well. Praise God. We can rejoice in our discovery like the plowman, but the treasure is not ours until we purchase the field. Now, just jumping back, many, many people search endlessly for the pearl and yet never realize that Jesus is what they're searching for. So many people have heard of Jesus Christ. So many, I dare say most, have heard the gospel and yet they don't recognize the treasure for what it really is and how tragic that people will stumble over Jesus Christ many times in their lives and yet never realize that he was the treasure that they were searching for. Jesus Christ and eternal life is the greatest treasure we will ever find on the face of the earth. Now buying the field, buying the pearl. See that you buy the field where the pearl is. Sell all and make a purchase of salvation. Think it not easy, for it is a steep ascent to eternal glory. Many are lying dead by the way, slain with security. 
when we discover, now that's Samuel Rutherford. He's a, I'm not sure what uh, century he was from, but uh, it looks to me by his appearance, probably the 18th or 19th century uh, the, or evangelist, evangelical. And when we discover this treasure in an unlikely field and recognize it for what it is, then suddenly all of life's previous treasures, quote unquote, become meaningless compared to what we have found. We can rejoice in our discovery like the plowman, but the treasure is not ours until we purchase the field. Jesus is clearly telling us in this parable that this treasure is going to cost us something. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 33. May someone read that, please. Jesus said, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Amen. Wow. We got to forsake a lot. A lot. You got to forsake everything. The plowman could have grumbled and complained that the field was too costly. The pearl merchant could have walked away from the perfect pearl because he did not want to pay the necessary price. Some people do not recognize the value of this treasure. They say it will cost me my friends, my lifestyle, my habits, my pride, my social reputation. No matter what price you have to pay, the treasure is still worth it. You're getting a bargain. Eternal life is cheap at any price. Amen. Boy. Some say being a Christian is just too hard. I have to give up too much. Jesus, uh, being a disciple of Jesus costs more than it's worth. Oh, you're getting a bargain. Eternal life is cheap at any price. It does require us to give up everything if necessary. But the value, the, the, the what, what we're getting, the reward is, is priceless. Jesus said that you will never pay more for the treasure than what it is worth. But no matter what price you have to pay, the treasure is still worth it. Again, you're a bargain. You're getting a bargain. Eternal life is cheap at any price. It's inexpensive at any price. It compared to anything, it is, it is a bargain compared to anything else. Jesus offered the great treasure to the rich young ruler. In Matthew chapter 19, but the young man walked away from it because he believed that his earthly riches uh, were more valuable. He wouldn't buy the field. He didn't think he could afford the pearl. If we could talk with that rich young ruler today, it is certain that he would feel differently about it now. Before Pentecost, even Simon Peter had some worries about the treasure. The treasure might cost too much. He questioned Jesus on the subject. And Matthew 19, verse 27 through 29. Please someone read that famous, well-known scripture, 19, verse 27 to 29. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What, sh what shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Everyone that hath forsaken house, or brethren, or sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for this name's sake, Amen. Amen. shall receive it hundredfold. Sorry, it's, it's not a strong message. Indeed, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, sis. Appreciate your reading. You shall inherit eternal life, everlasting life. Peter's transformation. Before Pentecost, which was about 50 days ago, 
afraid to be associated with Jesus. He denied Jesus and ran away. After Pentecost, preached to multitudes, greater than 3,000 repented. They were healed. 40-year-old man, crippled man, healed. Yes, and Peter defended his faith before the Sanhedrin. Maranatha Agama. Makama, what's Makama Agama? I'm not sure. I guess that's what the, the Sanhedrin was called. That's the Hebrew. Wow. That's Peter's transformation. His pearl of great price came at a cost, but he willingly yielded it up. Filled with the Holy Ghost, the strength, the strength, the strength, the Holy Ghost strength to overcome the flesh and our earthly desires. Praise God. Wow. Jesus, Jesus' answer was very clear. You will never give up more than what you will receive in return. What a glorious promise. The treasure is definitely worth the price. We need a revelation. We need a revelation of the value of the treasure. I guess we, we, we've just tried the best with, the, with you know, illustrating what a treasure means in earthly terms and comparing that and what a treasure means in spiritual terms. But how, how weak that comparison is really. If the price of the field seems too high, then we really do not recognize how valuable eternal life is. We're always looking for deals, but you couldn't possibly get a better deal than what we've talked about tonight. This double parable teaches us four things. We need to discover the treasure, the pearl. We need to recognize its true value. We need to pay the price to possess it. And like the plowman, we need to rejoice in what we now possess. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, that's the lesson for tonight. We have some discussion questions. And uh, we'll start with, anyone want to explain the first interpretation of the double parable? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. <laughs> Is Pastor Alex out there? I'm ready. Oh, oh wow. Okay, go ahead, sis. I'm My sorry. I, I was muted. I was talking, but go ahead, <laughs> Sister Patty. Well, the double parable is that Jesus is the, uh, is the pearl. And that when we find him, we become the treasure. And the church, the, the, he, what he found was you and me, which is the church of the living God. And Paul also said, uh, he, he uh, I think it was Paul or it might have been James, but we love him because he first loved us. Amen. Amen. And so he, he saw us as a great treasure, a great Amen. pearl. Yes. And that then allowed us to discover him as our great treasure and pearl. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful image. Right. Yes. I think that hits questions one and two quite effectively the second interpretation the first interpretation unless i'm missing something uh you know no. jesus no. is the pearl and we're the pearl um without question it, it it is we see ourselves coming to an understanding of this double parable we see ourselves immersed or in inside and also looking from the outside, we are in the church. But we look from the outside at the the church being the the uh, the possession that what the Lord gave His life for. Yes, and it's just remarkable. It is it is the ultimate. It is the the quintessential, if you will, um, message of the Bible of of the Word is what the Lord, what God Himself did. It is just so beautiful. What can we do to help ourselves recognize the true value of the treasure? Well, that's important. I guess we start off with, uh, you know, a feeling like if we had a great treasure, we'd make us feel good in the flesh. But what, what, 
what can we do to help us to help us each recognize the true value of the treasure? What can we do? Anyone have an answer for that one? Uh, be willing to sell everything that we have in our own possession and that, that, you know, that we've built up for ourselves in this world and in this life, our hopes, our dreams, our, uh, desires, and just completely give those all up so that we could be a part of the kingdom of God and, and, and receive his, his eternal life. Is that the answer? <laughs> well, it is. Yeah. I think to, to put ourselves in, again, in the context of this world and the, it, and uh, the the kingdom of God and God Himself, we having been having been marked, that is, baptized in His name and filled with His Spirit, we we can help ourselves. I guess really the word is appreciate the true value of the treasure. Our appreciation, is, of course, it's a it's a physical thing, you know, feeling of appreciation. You know, we go to somebody and say, "I appreciate you," and you really do. And, and, and sometimes you, you can get in situations where you really do appreciate. I can show you. I'll give you an example right here. Uh, all I can think of right now over the last six months or so was I'll never forget Sister Rose, uh, Sister Rosemary, walking towards that, uh, what is that, uh, pro-health. And I'm in the car, sick, and yes. uh, wanting to get my... Uh, uh, prescription and so on instructions to go get my COVID antibodies. And after I'd called her and she said, I'll be there in five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. And that, and sure enough to the minute she was there and she looked at me in the car and said, and I, and she just said, I, I read her lips. You just, you just stay there. And I stayed there and she came in and took care of everything so I could get that accomplished. That's kind of the appreciation feeling that, that I, I have now that I relate to. And, and that's the Lord. Amen. I mean, Rosemary is just another, you know, looks like everybody. That's the Lord. That's the grace of God working through her to do that. Fantastic. Yeah. And that's the appreciation to see the grace of God working in our brothers and sisters and appreciate it. Really, really feel thankful for it, you know? So how do you rec uh, it, it's just to meditate on the Lord and all he's done and what he's doing through uh, the saints and others and all the circumstances that, that we're in, that we get into. Well, all right, let's go. Uh, what kind of price do we pay? Uh, uh, do we pay to purchase the field that contains the treasure? What does it say? What kind of price do we pay? To per well, I, I feel like the price we pay is we're given our lives to Christ says, those that suffer with me shall reign with me. But a trite price is the treasure. The Holy Ghost is the treasure inside of us. And all our hurts and pains, he's smoothing it out. He's making it a pearl so it doesn't affect us like it did in the beginning of our walk or in the middle of our walk. God is just, it's a healing process. So as the oyster has the object that it doesn't want, it wants to reject it, it starts to fix it so we can accept it. So Christ is like working on us to make the old things fade away, to make a new thing so the old things don't affect us like it used to because God is making us a pearl. Amen. Right. Thanks, Brother Rich. Appreciate that. <laughs> What else can we say? We're, we are in the process of becoming that pearl. With oh, it's it's there's so many things you, you can say, but that was that was good. Thank you, brother. What kind of promises do we have from Jesus Himself that assures us that the treasure is worth the price? This Ghost and the everlasting life that we have, not this world, but the next world, and His Holy Ghost is His promise. That's a no. That's a Christian no-brainer. You're absolutely right. Appreciate that. That's the last question, and thank you all. It was a pleasure giving this lesson, and thank you for your attentiveness. And I, I pray and hope and pray and know that the word uh, ministered to you tonight 
as it has to me. And uh, from, from this day forward, think of yourselves in terms of the value that you have. The Lord values each of us. And he, he valued us so much that he gave his life for us. Thank you. Thank you. Have, you, have, have a good rest of the week, folks. Thank, Thank you, Brother you. Ed. Thank you, Brother Ed. You're welcome. Thank you, Brother Ed. Praise that God. Lesson. That was a good lesson. Praise Absolutely. God. Absolutely. That was a tremendous lesson, Brother Ed. And I, I can well, imagine. Uh, yeah, don't forget the lessons were published originally, published by Bethel. And that's uh, this is one of Brother Doug Davis's yeah. originals. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it just it really is a wonderful reminder that uh, when we are struggling in this life with trials and tests and difficult circumstances, it reminds us that we have given up the good life in this world, so to speak, the riches and pleasures that would have been available to us perhaps if we had simply ignored the call of Christ in our lives and uh, gone our own way to pursue our own desires. But the fact that we were willing to sell all those desires, all those plans, all that we hoped for in ourselves um, for something that we, you know, a God we cannot see, a promises that are beyond our understanding uh, that's true faith and that's true love. And it's, a, it's wonderful that to be reminded of the fact that we have invested, we've made a good investment. We've made the best investment because for the, the, the treasures of this world cannot compare, the whole of the treasures of this world cannot compare to one moment, one minute, one hour in heaven. Mm -hmm with Jesus Christ That's so true. and in, in, in the salvation that he has given to us for eternal life. It, it, there's, no, there's no comparison, folks. Whatever you give up in this world, whatever suffering or trial you have to go through, it's worth it by far for the treasure of heaven. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and death doth corrupt but lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where they will be. I forget the rest of the scripture, but they, they, they are preserved. Yes. Yes. Amen. All right. Thank you, brother Ed so much for that lesson. God bless all of you. Thank you for joining us. We want <clears throat> to close out with prayer tonight. Oh, and ask the Lord. Yes. Sister Patty. Um. <clears throat> I think Melissa is still on. Is she still on? I uh, see her on there. Yeah. I'm still on. Okay. Still on. Yes. Uh, so Sister Melissa, you know, I, she was sharing with me that she's going through some health issues with dizziness and um, lightheadedness. And that's really strange, you know, when you have to you know, and it's throwing off her sleep and everything. So I asked her if we could pray over her this evening, if that's okay, brother. All right, absolutely, yes. Yeah. All right, everyone, let's let's pray for Sister yeah. Melissa right now. We pray against these health issues, and we pray and have, claim like God's have. peace and yes. good sleep. Amen. In Jesus' name, protect Jesus us, Lord. Name. In Jesus', Jesus name. name. Right now, Jesus, Lord God, Jesus, I pray Jesus, for Lord, Melissa, right my dear wife, Lord God. Lord, 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 Lord Jesus, right Lord, Jesus. Lord, I claim Jesus. healing. We ask you, Lord God, to send your healing angels for her. That, that Lord, right now, in Jesus, and whatever is causing her lightheaded, whatever is causing dizziness, whatever is causing her, Lord God, to be thrown off and to throw off her sleep. Pray again. Right now, Lord God, we pray, Lord Jesus, that when you're doing it, Lays to Jesus, sleep at Lord, night that she will go to sleep God. right away and she will have a sleep you, Lord God. Lord God. Praise and she will get the rest that she needs, Lord God. For she works hard through the day, Lord God. Give her that rest in Jesus' name. We ask it for it right now. We pray against this attack on her body. We pray against it in the name of Jesus. I ask you to loose her from it, God, that you would get all the glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Jesus' name. Praise Hallelujah. God. Praise God. Praise Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Sister Hallelujah. Patty. Hallelujah. Praise and God. We want to pray one more prayer that, of separation and, and dismissal tonight uh, that the Lord would uh, allow this word to settle in our hearts and our minds and that would bless us for the rest of this week as we uh, go into um, the VBS season uh, this weekend and uh, and as we meet together as the body of Christ on Sunday that God would continually pour out his blessings and his uh, inspiration on us both day and night. Precious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank praise you. We thank you for this word, for the beautiful reminder, Lord God, of the treasure that we have found in you, Lord God, and the treasure that you have found in us. We are valued, Lord Jesus, by the one who is beyond value. Lord Jesus, God, we praise you. Thank you, Lord. Let this word settle into our hearts and our minds. Let it lead and guide us, Lord God, in our decisions and our circumstances throughout this week, Lord God. And let it be with us as that we could be we free, Lord, Lord God. Week, Lord God. Help us to give up all once to you, again. Lord God. Help us to you withhold the body of Christ, the family, Lord, Lord God. Hallelujah. In Suffolk County, Hallelujah. On Sunday, Lord God, at the outreach, Lord. Bless the in Jesus' name, bless each and every one of us. Give us safety, peace, rest, and health, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, help us in Jesus' name. Well, praise God, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, may God be with you as you go your way. And we look forward to seeing you again next week or whenever the Lord chooses, whatever God wills. Uh, we love you all. Don't ever forget that. And we'll keep you in prayer if you keep us in prayer. Amen. 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 All right. We'll keep God. you in prayer anyway. Amen. <laughs> God bless you all. You are dismissed. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.